All right. So before I um, go ahead and introduce Kyle to the rest of our listeners today, I will um, ask that all of our speakers and co-hosts today are muted, um, except for when you are speaking or responding to a question. Um, for those that are in the audience today, we will have a few minutes towards the end of the conversation for one or two audience questions. Um, so please keep that in mind. Um, and I will be tuned in to see um, who raises their hand to request to speak. Without further ado, um, I would again like to welcome you all to today's conversation, our very first Twitter space for Fair Vote. Um, very exciting opportunity, but also a very relevant and exciting conversation. Uh, we will be led today by Kyla Pitts, who is the EVP of Policy and Programs at Fair Vote, has 20 years of political strategy experience, um, and has been EVP with Fair Vote over the last um, two years. So thank you so much, Khaled, um, who will be introducing the rest of our panelists. And Khaled, I will turn it over to you. Sure. And I want to thank everyone for being part of this. As Rachel said, this is our first uh, Twitter space. But as this organization has been grown uh, exponentially, although it's been around 30 years, over the last two years since I've been here and come on board, um, we are sort of expanding our reach and expanding our program. And one area that I am proud to say that we've made up a big emphasis on is reaching out to the African-American community and engaging them uh, on the power of their vote, not only uh, getting to the ballot, going to the, 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 the ballot box, but also what that vote can mean after you vote. And some of our biggest issues about ranked choice voting uh, touches that, but even more about how they're being represented. And one of the things we push for is proportional representation, uh, which as we see what just happened with the Supreme Court in the Alabama case um, is uh, maybe seeing the writing on the wall about minority, uh, majority districts and how that might be diluted with challenges uh, in the ensuing year. So uh, I would again want to thank you very much for taking part of this call and being part of uh, the growth of this issue uh, and um, uh, trying to figure out reform ways that we can uh, retain the power of African American voters here in the country. Over. <laughs> Thanks, Colin. Um, so I will turn over to you for a second to start the uh, panel questions. But for our panelists today, we are very excited to have Alexi McCammon, who is a political reporter from Axios. We have Stephanie Brown James, who is the co-founder of the Collective Pack. We have Marcus Bachelor, activist, advocate, and also deputy director for leadership programs at People for the American Way. And then we also have uh, Jessica Pierce, who is a political, seasoned political strategist and founder of Peace by Peace Strategy. So again, thank you all for our panelists for your time today. Um, Kyle, I'll, I'll turn to you for the question. Yes. Well, before I begin, you know, our discussion about democracy. Um, I would be amiss not to mention and send thoughts and prayers to the citizens of Ukraine, you know, as they face a mortal threat to their own democracy and with the hopes of peace and diplomacy uh, that it can you know, prevail. Um, uh, I'll be directing my questions towards specific panelists, but I encourage our participants to jump in or piggyback on each other's ideas. So we have a sort of a good discussion here today uh, with the first question. I'd like to get the conversation started by um, asking Stephanie about uh, the work of the collective uh, PAC and ha has been doing uh, as the largest organization that solely focuses on building black political power. What are some of the biggest barriers and hurdles that candidates of color are facing? Thanks so much, uh, Khalid and Farrah vote, vote for uh, having this I think conversation we're still today. To bring Stephanie on as a speaker. Oh, can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can. Okay. Stephanie, that, yeah, yes, we can. Okay, cool. No, thanks so much, um, Khaled and Fairvote, for, for having this conversation. It's always timely, and sadly, it's probably way too more timely than it, than it needs to be because it continues to be a question about, you know, what does voting reform look like for black voters? I could tell you that when we started the Collective Pack now almost six years ago in 2016, we were really focused on how we can bring equity and uh, the representation of black people in this country. You know, we know that unfortunately, 90% uh, of all elected officials in this country are white, 95% uh, 
of all prosecutors are white. Um, and so for us to have a democracy that works for the people, it should be made up of the people. Um, and most importantly, to, to change the law so that they uh, better reflect the needs um, uh, of, of our communities, we need to change the lawmakers. And so the collective is focused on making sure that black candidates across the country get the support that they need. Because when it comes to uh, the sexism and racism that they face uh, every day, you know, black women are five times more likely to receive less donations when she's running for office than anyone else. You know, we know that, that there's a number of barriers that prevent black candidates from, from being successful. Yet when we look at uh, what often propels black voters, especially to the polls, is when they have a candidate that you know respects, reflects their communities that help drive their enthusiasm to go vote, to pick someone who is going to be a decision maker that has has their community you know first and foremost in mind. And so, you know, we've been able to raise over forty million dollars to, to fuel our work on, on two halves, the political side, but also on the voter engagement side. Uh, finally, I'll just say that. We're going to continue to, you know, do all we can to, to support black, black uh, candidates. But I'm so happy that this combo is really centering uh, black voters in, in the reform uh, pro, reform needs that are needed. Thank you, Stephanie. You know, Jessica, um, you bring experience as an activist and a leader for BYP 100 in creating the change you want to see. Can you speak to the role that your vote plays versus the role? of on the ground protests and activism? Yeah, absolutely. Um, happy also to be here with you all today um, and with folks that I've known for years and worked with for years um, and a good conversation here. Um, but I think it's really interesting, you know, like this is a constant conversation and I think in like an A, B, like opposition narrative that folks are rolling with to say that on one side, there's civic engagement and voting, and on the other side, there's protests, you know, outside, you know, the beltway kind of politics. And I think the reality of the situation is that if you talk to real strategists, folks that have been doing this work, uh, have been working on elections or have been organizing protest work on the ground, we understand there isn't any opposition, like, and that is a false narrative, right? Um, and if anything, if you just look at the political landscape, that will tell you that that, that is the reality, right? Um, so just like right now, we're seeing education being attacked. We're seeing transgender kids being attacked. We're seeing anti-protest bills being uh, introduced, right? Just last year, there were 81 anti-protest bills in 34 states, and there were 34 anti-voting rights bills in 19 states. That's not coincidental. It's not coincidental that at the same time that we're seeing that it's harder to vote right now than there were actual poll taxes in the past, it's also that they're penalizing the right to protest, right? And it's because they see that the coordination between the tactics actually does work, right? And that we, we don't actually have the luxury of, as people who are organizing, who do not have the same power as the institutions that we're facing, to choose between one or the other. We actually have to do both, and we have to do both consistently, and we have to do both well in coordination with each other. And that's not to say that every single person has to do every single tactic, but it, it, it is to say that we have to be in relationship relationship to each other and we can't be trying to say what tactic is better or, or who is more righteous or who has the better choice. We all have to be working together, running all of these tactics inside of election cycles and then moving into governance work and fighting and pushing back against elected officials after elections. Civic engagement isn't just about election day, it's about the entire process and I would argue that protest work, organizing on the ground is a part of civic engagement work as well because it is about making sure that we're holding the people who are elected accountable to the issues and the demands of the communities we come from. I can totally agree with you about, uh, as an organization, as an individual, about it's about civic engagement, it's about the process uh, holistically. Um, Marcus, I'd like to direct this next question to you. You know, obviously, black people have been fighting for voting rights since the dawn of our country you know, here in America. And it's you know 2022, and there's still a constant push and pull to ensure all Americans vote. You've been dedicated much of your life to public service and advocating for Black communities at a young age. Um, what has been your motivation to get so involved in the fight for building a better, more representative democracy? And what uh, what are you looking forward to in this seemingly never-ending uphill battle? Yeah. Uh, so I mean. 
the the quick and dirty is that you know I grew up uh, just with a lot of influences uh, in front of me. College, you know, I grew up off of the intersection of Martin Luther King and Malcolm X. I went to schools named after Martin Luther King and Thurgood Marshall. So social justice um, has just been a part of. Uh, my coming of age, um, and I was really lucky at a young age to have folks, uh, adults in my life who not just uh, gave me, uh, you know, the knowledge to ha- to know the power of my own voice, but also gave me the room to lead. Um, and I think that that's so important. And so from a young age, knowing how important right my voice was in the process, knowing how important me growing up in marginalized and impoverished communities, me knowing the importance of my voice uh, made me think, about the importance of everyone else's voice in communities like mine or who share the same circumstances or skin color uh, as me. And so, you know, I got started in activism uh, working on a democracy issue related specifically to my community, which was D.C. statehood, uh, making sure that 700,000 residents uh, who pay the highest taxes per capita uh, and higher taxes than 22 states actually get to vote on how those dollars are spent. Um, And that work just expanded um, to issues of voting rights and voter representation um, across uh, the country. You know, I ran for office because I believe folks from my community didn't have a seat at the table. Um, And so, you know, all of that has been a part of my motivation. Where we are now, um, I think, is where, um, you know, I'm a student of history, knowing that generations before me have been in this position as well, right? And that freedom is not inherited, right? It's it's won by every generation. Um, And knowing that I, just like so many luminaries before me and so many folks on this panel whose shoulders I stand on, uh, you know, doing that work is just a part uh, of, of what we're supposed to do is the rent we pay, right, for our, for our space on earth. Um, and so where we are now is, is not the most ideal, right, but it is predictable, right? As when we take one step, right, in black advancement, we always see uh, a negative reaction um, in response. And so we knew that with the election of Barack Obama, we were going to get, right, the 2013 uh, decision by the Supreme Court to gut the Voting Rights Act. We would get state after state after state, uh, making it harder for black people and poor people uh, and women to uh, to have their voices heard. Um, and so uh, we just got to keep up the fight. Um, and while we're, we're not where we need to be, uh, we're much closer than I thought we would be a year ago. Um, and so that, that keeps me going. And, and I think in the end, uh, we'll win. You know, Marcus and I are both residents of Washington, D.C., and you know, not only him fighting locally, even though he works for a national organization for, you know, D.C. statehoods and representation for, you know, 700,000 D.C. residents, but also, you know, reforming uh, voting rights here locally. And I know he's working very strongly to move a, a ranked choice voting bill within the city council. And I thank him personally as a resident for all the hard work he's been doing. Uh, I want to turn to Alexi next. Um, you know, black voters have helped shape what democracy in America looks like today. And yet we're often only addressed during the 11th hour election appeals, leaving our communities feeling either dismissed or or, or even taken for granted. But now we're seeing a trend of more candidates running for office, including black black people, women, and other marginalized groups uh, who are starting to feel more empowered to run. Are you noticing this trend in your coverage of progressive groups? And what do you think is contributing to this moment? Well, thank you so much for having me. It's really good to be with you guys. And this is actually my first Twitter space, so I'm very excited that it's with Fair Vote and discussing voting reforms, particularly for Black voters. That's a big part of what I cover for Axios. I'm covering all things 2022 midterms, but as we've all been watching over the last several months, federal voting rights legislation has uh, failed to be to be signed into law. So many of these issues, including voting rights, are coming down to the states. I've certainly noticed, as you were just citing, an increase in the number of black candidates up and down the ticket, particularly this time around for governor's races, which are, of course, extremely important for voting rights because they can propose their own plans, veto voting restrictions that might come up from state legislatures. Um, But there are a number of reasons why we've seen this increase. One, of course, is representation. You all remember after Raphael Warnock was elected to the Senate in Georgia, that kind of opened the floodgates for a surge of black folks who stepped up 
and were calling him or even signing up to run for office because they were citing his victory saying, well, maybe I can win statewide when previously I thought someone who looked like me, who has my background, wouldn't be able to do that. The other thing that we've seen over elections is, um, I don't know, candidates not being afraid to lean into their lived experiences, to their personal bios. That's especially important this cycle, I think, for Democratic candidates who maybe want to try to distance themselves a little bit from the National Party brand or even from President Biden if he's particularly uh, underwater with approval in their states. But it's something that we've seen candidates lean into in their ads, in their stump speeches, in debates. And it's something that's resonating with voters more and more because I think really post-2016, voters want authenticity. And so if you're a black person in office and you're not afraid to talk about race, you're not afraid to talk about class, you're not afraid to talk about the issues that you know you see differently than someone else in Congress might see, I think that that perspective is something voters have really been rewarding and, and viewing as authentic and genuine. And that's something that I think rewards not just black candidates, but really any candidate who's willing to do that. Um, and then the last thing I'll say, is that this cycle in particular, there are so many open seats in all of the different races. I mean, I think about U.S. Senate races. There are six open seats for 2022 so far. And as you all know, open seats are more competitive. They draw more candidates. They draw more money and attention. That often means that we'll see more than one black person running in a primary. I think about the Maryland gubernatorial race. There are at least two black men in that Democratic primary already. And so that gives an opportunity long term, not just for more candidates to step up and see these other folks running, but to see how we can differentiate ourselves and not be viewed as a monolith when there are so many of us represented in these different races. Well, that's very insightful. And Alexi, this is my first uh, Twitter space as well. So uh, I want to apologize to the panelists and the audience for a little bit of like maybe a glitchy start because I wasn't quite sure we're sure alive because we didn't have a producer in my ear going, we're live, three, two, one. But you you talked about open seats um, and more candidates running. Fair Vote last year did a report um, around ranked choice voting and um, uh, candidates of color, particularly black candidates of color and voters. And we found that in a ranked choice voting system, uh, not only do black uh, candidates do better and they don't, and voters don't feel you're pitting one black candidate against the other, but actually black uh, voters actually engage more with ranked choice voting than their, their white counterparts. So uh, we'll see as that progresses, as more cities uh, and states take on, uh, uh, embrace ranked choice voting as a, as a, uh, a better uh, election uh, process to engage their voters uh, and get better representation, uh, more, or more representative candidates uh, in office. I want to turn next to the group um, and ask sort of a group question. And again, um, you know, how can we transform our electoral process in order to, to sort of meet the moment? Anyone can jump in first. Yeah, I, I'll go ahead and, and just really as a, a follow up to uh, Alexi, who, who does an amazing job um, covering black politics and uh, American politics. So just thank you, Alexi, for, for the work that, that you do. Um, thank you. you. You know, I think. It, Listen, one way we can we can change um, what's happening electorally is to elect the right people in office. <laughs> and I, you know, and I don't say it in jest, but I think, you know, and I mentioned earlier, listen, to change the laws, we must change the lawmakers. Um, what we've seen happening in states across this country where we have uh, voting rights significantly being scaled back, where we have no progress being made on, on criminal justice reforms, where we continue to debate um, issues that we've talked about for the past 50 years. A lot of that is because we have the same tired folks in political office that don't reflect the communities that really need strong leadership right now. Um, and so for us to have any either protections of our democracy around voting rights or for us to be able to have policies put in, in place that will actually progress our communities forward, we have to have the right decision makers at the table. And I know a lot of times, you know, politics has become this this bad word that almost people don't want to talk about politics, but politics is everything and everywhere. Um, and in order to, you know, have people have faith in the system, we have to have politics seen as this is these you're picking decision makers. And who should those people be? And as we look at uh, what's happening across states, you know, there's 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 one key role that's often overlooked in this process. That's Secretary of State. Right now, we only have three Black Secretary of States in the entire country, 
In fact, we only have 22 black people, that's on the Republican and Democratic side, that are serving in statewide offices. Now, to be in an equitable position as black people, we should have over 300 black people either elected or appointed into statewide positions. So we are vastly underrepresented as a community in positions where, you know, they're making huge decisions around voting rights, around other issues. You look at attorneys general. Can you imagine um, what would have happened um, if we did not have a strong black attorney general in Missouri to prosecute the George Floyd um, case? I mean, there, there are so um, many positions that we need to stay focused on on the statewide level in, uh, in order to help us protect the voting rights that we all need. Thanks. Anyone uh, else want to chime in on that? Yeah, I'd also just add that um, I mentioned briefly earlier that a number of um, sitting governors and gubernatorial candidates across the country are, have been proposing really like a flurry of voting reform proposals again because at the federal level it's stalled but also because they're seeing the ways in which this is affecting their communities of the color and particularly really on the ground i'm thinking about places like pennsylvania and michigan in particular um and also we're seeing in states like that swing states in particular folks turning to ballot initiatives both parties looking to ballot initiatives to try to pass some sort of voting measure or establish things like an independent redistricting commission to of course help with that down the line um but really, folks trying to meet this moment by not sitting and waiting around for, you know, the federal government or the president or Congress to do something, but but looking to their state executives in a new light, recognizing the power that state legislators have, um, and also reminding people that you can get things done through voting for a ballot initiative, not just a candidate. So true. So true. I know, Marcus, I know your work at the People for the American Way um, uh, does a lot of work focusing on uh, younger Americans, particularly younger Americans of color, you know, running for office at the local level. Can you speak a little bit more to that? Sure, yeah. So as Deputy Director of Leadership Programs, I get to work uh, with our Young Elected Officials Network, which is a network of 1,300 um, young elected leaders at all levels of government, from school board to state houses to the United States Congress, um, who, are, who are driving bold progressive solutions to our issues. Um, and central to those, especially recently, uh, have been protecting the right to vote. So when we've, you know, had actions targeting Congress or, or the White House over the last several months, we've amplified the voices uh, of those young leaders who wouldn't be able to have the opportunity to serve their communities if we didn't open up right the electoral process to folks like them. So many of them have the benefit of having been able to be propelled into office and into leadership by progressive electoral systems, and we know a rolling back right of that not just right uh impacts the voter but but to to stephanie's point Im impacts the folks that voters elect um and so you know th these young people's perspectives their experience um is is changing politics nationally but is also changing the quality of life in real ways for their neighbors locally and so um, i'm really excited uh, to be able uh, to work uh, alongside them and to that point right um and i think it, it the point was made by alexi a lot of the front line uh, for beating back these attacks, um, especially with the federal government's failure to act, is going to be at the local level. So making sure that city councils and county agents and state legislatures are ready to do whatever they can to make sure that we have as wide access uh, to the ballot uh, as possible is going to be key. Uh, and then I'll just say very quickly, People for the American Way, um, from a national perspective, is also looking at how we really make sure that we center voting right and center democracy um as as important as we say it is right that does mean passing federal legislation that makes uh, election day a national holiday right we get off for a lot of things but not to s secure the future of our democracy we're talking about a national popular vote right instead of the antiquated electoral college system that is given a minority of voters the presidency twice in my lifetime we're talking about expanding and their early voting and vote by mail, all of the, you know, decreasing the influence of money in politics, all of those are going to be central to building a better democracy and one that's more inclusive for all of us. Well, you, you mentioned the federal government a couple of times, you know, um, 
you know, last, you know, the, the last year we, we saw 19 states pass laws restricting access to voting. And we've all witnessed, as you alluded to, the collapse of the John you know, Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. Overall, efforts to undermine the, the, to continue to be serious about the threat in 2022. You know, can you speak to your organizations, what are your organizations is doing to counter current attacks on democracy? And what are some realistic solutions that can be implemented? I, I want to start off with Stephanie and then turn to Jessica. Stephanie, do we have you still? Sorry, took me a minute. Um, and actually, I, I feel like I've been talking a lot, so I'm, I'm up past it to my homegirl, Jessica. Jessica, you got was, the mic. I got the mic. <laughs> um, I mean, I think one thing that we're just clearly doing, and I've been doing ever since I came into politics, is that we're actually training and consistently training and organizing more and more people. Um, the reality of the situation is that if we looked at Freedom Summer uh, after George Floyd was murdered, we saw more people that are being organized than we see that are consistently being organized in this moment, right? And so part of that is that it is our job as organizations who are in this work to transfer that engagement, that excitement, that energy that we saw on the streets into collective power that we can utilize right now. And so that's what we do at Peace by Peace Strategies is that we, we help train organizations, we help build movements, build organizations um, so that we can actually exercise the power. But we have to build the power before we exercise it. I think the other thing, too, is that, like, just generally, we have to stop acting like we're winning because we're not. Um, and I think staff did a really good job of pointing out, you know, who's getting elected right now. But if we're looking at who's getting elected or we're looking at the issues um, that are being discussed, what, who is winning right now? And the reality of the situation is we're not winning in legislatures. We're not winning in communities. Um, and, and people, our people, our communities are the people that are feeling that the most. So the reality of the situation is that we have way more power to build right now. Um, and I would hope, and I, you know, to the, the folks that aren't in, you know, collective organizations right now, you know, one thing I would say on the individual level is that, you know, we have to stop believing in individualism. Um, and I feel like this happens every single election cycle. You know, we have this moment of like, well, why should I vote? And the reality of the situation is, why aren't you doing everything you possibly can right now to try to actually get to the place where we're winning anything? Because I'm not winning anything right now, and our communities aren't even thriving right now. They're barely surviving right now. Um, and so we have to realize that individualism only serves the institutions that we're fighting and we're up against. It does not actually serve our communities. Um, and voting is just a part of what we need to do, right? So we need to be collectivizing the vote. We need to be mobilizing the collective vote to say this is what it demands this is what our communities require um and the last thing i would say is i hope that we're starting to build new narratives and we stop engaging in these toxic narratives out here that are starting to win elections uh you know i think one of the greatest lessons out of virginia last year is that you know this you know critical race theory you know critical race theory is not real um and we saw people make that a real argument and you know it is just telling history correctly Right? It's just not relegating black history to one month a year. Right? It's not relegating history to just talking about MLK and Malcolm X. Um, and so, you know, where are the new narratives that we're starting to craft? What are we investing people in? And there has to be something proactive. And I say that to organizations, to our elected officials, to folks that are on the ground right now. We have to be building new narratives that say something different and, and key our, our communities into a vision of something different so that folks understand the importance of why they have to be in the voting booths on election day and why they have to be on the streets after election day. No, so, I, oh, go ahead. Sorry, if, if I could just add to that and, um, you know, I, I would say that Jessica and I, we, I mean, we, we both come from the frame of thought that organizing uh, is, is of the utmost importance. Like we have to continually organize and train. Um, and so I'm so happy that she brought up those points. Um, and I think sometimes we can make things seem so, uh, everything is so strategic and everything is so, get out there, talk to your neighbors, organize, um, get together, provide, you know, as many resources and opportunities um, for folks to, to have access. I know one of the things that we did in 2020, which we're excited to do um, this year is we provided over 100,000 free rides to and from the polls um, for black voters, um, specifically in those states that we know are always at the top of the list of where we need to be. Um, but the, the, the need for that, which I think can 
you know, we can sometimes forget that some folks just don't even have the ability to get to their polling location. Yes, we got to let them know where it is, but also let's help them get there. Um, and as Jessica said, let's help people do all that they can do um, in order to, uh, to to make a difference in the system. But, you know, it really is upon all of us to do something um, because clearly everything needs to be done in this moment. Thanks. You know, I, a quick question for Alexi. I think it was Stephanie earlier who sort of highlighted and pointing out your your co- your coverage of, uh, you know, black candidates running for office, the impact of black voters. Um, yet, I think many of us can say we don't see that same emphasis uh, happening in other particularly mainstream uh, media outlets. Can you speak to that a little bit, why you haven't seen that same sort of engagement at, uh, at other uh, outlets? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, frankly, I feel like news outlets, you know, usually look to their black reporters to cover black folks and their Latino reporters to cover Latino folks. But I'm obviously not in every newsroom. I just know based on my experience and of course, meeting other reporters who cover similar things as I do, that's always the trend. Um, And I think one thing that I just would love to see in the future is more white reporters covering, you know, black Mm -hmm. communities, communities of color, these voting trends. It's not to say that there are none, um, but of course, we are overrepresented in in, uh, this space. So I know that I'm grateful to do the work that I do for Axios. I have, you know, a, a long interest in elections. I've been covering them since 2017 with Axios in particular and and since then you know whether it's special elections midterm elections or presidential I've always made it a point to focus my reporting not just on black communities but all communities of color because as you all have seen demographic shifts lead to major political shifts this year in particular we have redistricting that obviously is something we've seen that can change the racial makeup of a district which can lead to an entirely different outcome. So there are so many questions to consider now. And when we were just talking about critical race theory, you know, critical race theory, or even like the word woke, which we see being used all the time now, I feel like those are just flags for people when they're really talking about race. And usually when they're really talking about black folks or black parents or black voters or black candidates. So I hope that we can, as you know, the media move away from maybe just regurgitating the same rhetoric, which I know folks have been making a more concerted effort to do, especially with the word woke, um, and instead focus on, you know, what these initiatives actually would solve, what they're rooted in, and not allow people to just dismiss it or attack it because it's actually something that's based in race and not education. Thanks. You know, you know so far in this conversation, we've been talking about, you know, politics, you know, organizing, obviously voting. Um, Alexi just talked about initiatives out there. You know, one po- initiative or policy you may want to call it is ranked choice. You know, ranked choice voting. Um, you know, it is a reform that's gaining momentum across the country and helping to get more women and people of color into office, especially in crowded races. When we just seen in New York this year uh, or last year that the the city that used ranked choice voting for the very first time in its mayoral election. Um, We've seen that only for the second time in history that um, that an African American uh, has been elected mayor in that ci- uh, mayor of that city. But we also saw and we not just speaking of just African Americans or blacks. We also saw uh, its impact on on women in that city. The, the city council, for the very first time, the majority of city council members are actually women, with a good portion of that being uh, women of color. Um, I want to talk pro a little bit more in that about folks' thoughts on ranked choice voting and how we can get, talking about organizing earlier, uh, you know, Stephanie and Jessica, more of the black community, especially older, civically engaged audiences, to be more open to changes in our electoral process, whether it's ranked choice voting or, or other reforms. And I know Marcus talked about some other reforms there. I want to sort of hear from Marcus on this, and then I will, I'll turn uh, next to Alexi. So I'm, I'm interested to see how this comes up in your coverage, in your coverage as well. Yeah, so I mean, real time uh, example, you know, I'm a part of the rank the vote campaign here in DC to move us to a ranked choice system. Um, and, and I think, you know, 
it's important that we talk about right the the real consequences of a ranked choice system and i mean that in the positive sense right in every space we've seen it right it's increased the diversity of representation in legislative bodies it's decreased right uh it's increased the the diversity um in in elected office across the board um and that's important we also know that ranked choice voting changes the nature of campaigning, which is also transformative for our democracy, right? So it doesn't, I, you know, I've, I've been on the campaign trail. I've run for office before. I've even been in a field of 20 candidates and I've heard it over and over and over again, right? If I had a second vote or if I could choose, you know, more than one person, you, you'd be my choice. Um, and that also, right, silos people into not being able to have the real conversations with candidates that they would usually have if they had the nuance of multiple choices, that if they were able to rank their candidates in order. Um, and so I think changing the way Right, we elect folks also changes the nature of campaigns, and and you know that you know uh, is a that changes that transforms the nature of negative campaigning. Right, it means that you co uh, candidates build coalitions among one another. It means that voters can hold more than one meet and greet for more than one candidate. That they can think about right their policy choices, and at the, and on election day, right they the majority of voters won't feel like they lost because even though they might not have gotten their first or their second choice, they got somebody closer to their ideal than maybe somebody who would have won in a plurality election with 25 or 30 percent of the vote who they absolutely abhor. So reforms like that change the way um, candidates, right, and governments work, but it also changes the way voters interact uh, with the with the democratic process, um, and I think that that's super important. So we're pushing that here um, in D.C. Um, and and even though we have right a really diverse uh, elected government, uh, there are gaps, right? When I ran for office coming from the community I come from, and for those familiar with D.C., east of the river uh, is what uh, folks pretty much uh, associate with kind of being the blackest, poorest section of our city. When I was running citywide, right, I said that there hasn't been in over a decade a citywide elected leader elected from east of the Anacostia River. So issues around poverty and issues around public safety don't lend Right, a citywide voice to those most acutely impacted by it. And a ranked choice system would shift, right, the way that people think about their choices and think about uh, the diversity of candidates. Because it's not just about, right, race and gender, it's also about the set of experiences that bring us to public service as well. And so ranked choice voting really does account for all of those things. Thanks, Marcus. Alexis. Yeah, Real quick, sorry. Real quick, Alexi, before I let you answer, Kyle, we're at about the um, eight minute mark. Okay. I don't have much to add in the way of how this has shown up in my reporting, truthfully, because I haven't focused much on it. But I know for sure this year it'll be a bigger issue, not just as we're focusing broadly on voting reforms. But as you all remember, we just had ranked choice voting implemented for the first time. in New York City for the mayoral race. And during the debate, the candidates were asked, which I thought was a really helpful and educational moment for people watching. They were asked, who would be your second choice? Obviously, assuming they're the candidates' first choices themselves. And a number of the candidates mentioned some of the women candidates in the primary, which, you know, backs up the data that I know that you all have, which shows that ranked choice voting actually, you know, is beneficial for women, people of color, and some even think that. A ranked choice voting system makes whoever is elected more accountable to uh, who they represent because, of course, they're represented and elected from a much broader swath of voters than they would be uh, with just a single, you know, type of vote. Thanks. Just, Thanks. Um, I, go ahead. So, sorry, if I could just say one really quick thing here too, and just I, I think sometimes too we have to think about the people that we're organizing, and I, you know, every day in this work, I'm very accountable to the communities I come from because that's who I work with every single day. Well, we talk about issues like this, I think sometimes we, you know, because we know we're, we're right and we know that this is the right thing to do, uh, you know, we over, you know, philosophize it. We don't use words that are actually helpful for folks, right? And the reality of this situation is that in this country, our average media literacy is lower than the average international media literacy, right? So we have folks that are, you know, sometimes watching news programs or watching these narratives that we craft in organizations that they simply just don't understand. Um, and if we couple that with like the way that disinformation and misinformation is permeating our communities every single week, I mean, I look at just what happened the 
you know, the crack pipe claim, you know, from the Biden administration, the false claim that was spread through black ta tabloids, there were way more likes on the false claim than the retraction. Um, and so I think that we have to sometimes, you know, instead of over philosophizing this, think about how can we break this down in a way that actually meets our folks where they're at using terms that they know, um, you know, in speaking and changes and things that they desire, and they will actually understand. I think our people are inherently ready for change. I think they're inherently looking for opportunities to to engage. Um, and it's on our, our ourselves, our communities, us even as individuals on a local level to just do better about how we message and communicate these things yeah. to our folks. So true. You know, uh, as you know, we as we mentioned redistricting earlier, and as you go through our current redistricting process, we're seeing black voters cracked and packed to reduce uh, our voting power. Uh, one of the main reforms that uh, we're supporting at Fair Vote is the the Fair Representation Act, which would move us from a single member house district to multi member districts elect, uh, elected proportionally and really make the ideal of majority rule, majority rule, minority voice a, a real reality. You know, what are your thoughts on this? Is the last question. I know direct this to like Jessica and Marcus, particularly. What are your thoughts on this kind of structural reform and how we take on gerrymandering in, in, in states across the country? Jessica, you want to lead us on this one? Yeah, um, I mean, I think that, I mean, I, my, I mean, my point on this is like very easy, very clear, which is like we have to be fighting for structural reform while we're also, we are in the middle of an election cycle right now. I mean, sending love, especially to my folks right now in Texas right now, you know, um, you know, like we are in the middle of an election cycle. And so I think that it's like, it really is the combination of the three. And I often think of things in threes because three is Delta. It's a universal symbol of change in this country, but we have to be changing the system and actually moving to a place where we're building a new democracy, uh, a new anti-racist democracy. Let me see more specifically, because a lot of times people talk about building back to the democracy without understanding that true democracy hasn't existed for many communities and many identities in this country and that we actually have to build something new. We have to be engaging in this election right now and we have to be engaging around the issues and building power and supporting the movements and the folks that are building on the ground locally with folks that are providing mutual aid to folks because let's also be clear there are natural disasters and things that are happening within communities right now as well and so i think you know that's the clear purpose we have to do all three we have to talk about all three that live in the same world um because that's actually i think our only opening into actually getting any change on any of the three levels Thanks, Marcus. You want to quickly uh, touch on this before we see if we have any questions from the audience? Yeah, no, I mean, the only thing I'll say is that that's absolutely right. You know, I think we have to consider a whole bunch of reforms that, that bring more people and, and ampl bring more people in and amplify more voices. And I think the Fair Representation Act can be one of the ways to do it. I think we should acknowledge that there are several states across the country already doing uh, this multi-member district um, uh, structure, including our neighbors in Maryland. Um, and so we're, we're seeing successful examples of this happening in state legislatures across the country. Um, and I think it, it, would, it would be a, a solution that we should consider uh, for the federal government as well. Thanks. And you know, Rachel, I know we have uh, about three or so minutes left. Do we have a, do, you, do you think we have time for, uh, uh, if we, there is one, a question from the audience? Yeah, let's see if we have time for one question from the audience. Um, for those that are in the audience listening, if you would like to raise your hand to request a question, feel free to do so now. While people are raising their hand, um, one thing that I like to kind of end these conversations with is kind of giving people actionable uh next steps if they so choose to participate or to be involved and so i like to pose the questions to the group um what are some next steps what are some resources that people can um be in tune for what should people be looking out for we're heading into a um a very active midterm election season so if anybody wants to touch on that while we're waiting for raised hands yeah, I'll just say quickly, and I think, uh, you know, it, it, even as Jessica mentioned, I mean, right now we already have voting happening in Texas. Um, so please encourage all your Texas folks, folks to go out and vote early because right now we're seeing um, pretty low turnout numbers and we know we need to increase that. But, you know, and, I, and I'm a broken record here. Uh, we can have a lot of ideas about reforms if we have the right people in office who's going to actually get them passed. And so my biggest takeaway is we have to double down on the importance of voter registration, which I know feels cliche and something we do all the time, but it can never stop. 
but our education can never stop speaking in a voice that's realistic to people. I love what you said, Jessica. Like I was thinking, man, I wish the, 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 the bill or reforms was called, who's your first and second choice? That's literally what we're asking people. But you know, sometimes it's again, in a way with which we, we presented. And so I just think that, you know, being able to also support black candidates, um, give them money. Even if it's a little bit, it helps and they need it. We have six black folks running for U.S. Senate right now um, who are progressives. Um, and they, 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 they need our support to help really change one of the most important offices and um, uh, bodies in this land. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, we just received a request from Cliff Albright, so I will give you the floor to ask your question. Hey, thank you so much and, and glad to be on. Um, quickly, a question and a quick comment. Um, I, I support, you know, as I know, it, the Fair Representation Act it seems to me to be consistent with the, the philosophies of, of Lonnie Guinier and some of the approaches that she used to talk about it as a, as a, a means, proportional representation as a means of fighting against racist gerrymandering. With that said, you know, I've, I've talked to some people that have concerns, whether about the act itself or just about rank choice voting in general, about the impact on race equity. Um, again, not, not, not concerns that I necessarily share, but I just wanted to, and, and I missed the first few minutes of this, so forgive me if you weren't really addressed it, but I just wanted to know if you all could, you know, almost playing devil's advocate, if you would just address some of those concerns. And then the suggestion or the comment I wanted to make is I would actually, you know, love to see, um, in the spirit of the conversation that folks are just having about the, about this election cycle, you know, particularly in regards to the Senate, you know, so that we don't find ourselves in a situation where um, we, we we think people are being elected that support voting rights and voting reforms, and then they get there and, and they don't. I would love to see what I'm referring to as a, as a voting rights compact, you know, a list of four or five measures, um, several of which we're very familiar with, John Lewis Voting Rights Act, Freedom to Vote, et cetera, but some type of upfront contract with voters um, saying that when folks get there, that, that they won't then do what Mansion and Cinema did to us. So um, those are my two points or question and point. Well, thank, thanks. I'm going to turn this to Marcus, maybe to at least answer that. But I like that idea of, uh, you know, contract for voting uh, 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 that groups can come together and, and uh, get behind Marcus. Yeah, thanks, Cliff, um, and it's good to hear from you. I'll, I'll just say very quickly. I mean, I think on the ranked choice voting part, right? I, you know, we what what we've seen is that you know while we try to explain the real benefits, and we've got to for sure explain it in plain language to people the real benefits in terms of r racial equity and representation that a ranked choice voting system will produce. There's also right the the disinformation and kind of the the talk. Um, that, you know, black people, you know, poor folks just won't understand it. They'll never get it, right? Your grandma's not going to know how to vote anymore. And I think we need to, like, dispel those those rumors as well that, you know, given the resources and the information, black voters all rise to the occasion just like everybody else. And, right, just in New York, right, when we talked about, right, the impact on, on racial uh, and gender representation, right, we saw an increase of, of black and brown folks elected to the city council in New York, right? We saw an increase of women, right? And and some people will say, well, that's because we saw an increase in those groups running, but it's because, right, of the openness of a ranked choice system, right, that, that folks found the courage and the motivation to go out and run. And so, you know, both on the front end and the back end, what we're seeing in terms of the real application of this system is that it's driving up participation uh, and, uh, and the election of, of black and brown folks and women uh, astronomically. I'm also with you, right, that we should hold people accountable, hold especially our candidates uh, who are running this time accountable, right, to, to pushing forward the reforms that are necessary, right? I've heard Mandela Barnes say over and over again, he can't wait to get to the United States Senate to be the deciding vote on comprehensive voting rights legislation. And we need to hold as many candidates as possible accountable to that work as well so that when they get there, right, they know that that's priority one. Um, so I, I fully agree with you. Thanks, Marcus. I want to be mindful of time and just ask Rachel, do we want to take one more question or do, uh, or do you think we should uh, close out? Yes, if, if I do have the um, permission from the panel, I'd love to take one additional question, if that's okay, and then we'll close out right after that. 
a paddle. Can you stay on for another like five minutes? Yep, that's fine. Great. Okay, so I'm going to bring on Ray Reed, who is a Democratic candidate for Missouri Second Congressional District. Um, Ray, feel free to ask your question. Ray, you're a speaker. Go ahead and feel free to take yourself off mute and ask your question. Oh, yeah. I don't have a um, question, just a comment. Um, I'm a candidate for Congress, uh, 25 years old, and I just like can't stress enough. Like, Money's always great, but it is so, so, so important for folks to sign up and knock on doors and make phone calls. Like, I promise that makes all the difference in getting uh, young or just black Democrats elected in our communities. Thanks, Ray. Oh, sorry. Thanks, Ray. I know Jessica and uh, Stephanie talked about organizing out there, uh, knocking on doors, speaking to voters and getting your message out there. Uh, and with Marcus and the work that he's doing at People For and Young Candidates, you know, helping young candidates run for, run for office. So I'm glad to hear we've got this next generation of, of black leaders and potential leaders, um, you know, getting engaged. So good luck to you out there. Thank you, Call It. Thank you, Ray. And again, thank you to all of our panelists today. Um, I know that we do have a couple of requests, but uh, given the interest of time, um, I will give our panelists their time back as we want to allow them to get back to the front lines, respectively. Um, but thank you again for attending today. We look forward to hosting more Twitter spaces to have more um, important conversations with Fair Vote. And um, Call It, I will turn to you for any closing remarks. Just quickly, and again, uh, it's, I think it's apropos that we're having this conversation during Black History Month. Yet, you know, uh, as our panelists have said, you know, this is only one month. And I, I can say that this conversation definitely is one that we will maintain and will paint its relevance well beyond February, especially as we get closer and closer to the midterm elections. And again, I just want to thank, again, all of our panelists for uh, your time, particularly our first you know, Twitter space for their insight and all the hard work that they're doing uh, in your respective fields. And of course, I want to thank you, the audience, for attending and participating in today's conversation. We're wishing you a, a beautiful Thursday and a great weekend. And uh, keep the, the fight that's going on out there. Thank you.